really neat for people when you're on the outside of this looking in you say oh my god is that such a neat place you know but when you come get into it you, you kind of take it for granted but when I when I came here in 95 I it was an emotional thing for me to be part of this people appropriately identified the internet as a medium that could change everything and that would in fact create lots and lots of new businesses that would be very successful and have a number of different characteristics. They would grow faster than businesses had ever grown, that the inherent profitability would be there because the hypothesis was this was a much lower cost way of doing business. I remember once sitting with um, someone and I asked for their business model and they, they said, well, we're not interested in that right now. Our goal is to get eyeballs. I said, what do you mean eyeballs? He said, well, you know eyeballs. We've got to get people looking at our website. And I said, well, that's good, but what's your business model? He said, no, you don't understand, Kurt. We want eyeballs. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, eyeballs? Eyeballs? That is not a business model. I get a big kick out of uh, the younger people that we have working for us now because, you know, they all talk about this, the new millennium will never we, the times are different and we aren't going to see any more downturns and all that. And I, I have to kind of look back at my own past and say, boy, I've been up and down so many times it's been like a yo-yo. <laughs> and, uh, and each time you think that uh, it is going to stay up for the sustained period, but what you soon learn is that when it shuts down, it really shuts down in a hurry. And a lot of people left. Uh, not because they didn't like Agilin or anything about the company, but the perception was that uh, uh, some of the uh, dot-coms and other startup companies were going to provide a uh, quicker way to, uh, to riches. Everyone was turning into millionaires overnight uh, from stock options and um, IPOs. And uh, it was just, you know, it's kind of enticing when you're, you know, you're fresh out of college and you see all that stuff and all the magazines and everything. You're just like, that's the place I need to go. So that led me to Silicon Valley. So I think there are some uh, inflated expectations, uh, but those inflated expectations seem to be rewarded in the stock markets and that therefore attracted a lot more entrepreneurs and, and venture capitalists to continue to, to create new firms and to, and to build the, uh, you know, new businesses and so on. It was a roller coaster, up and down, that quick. So we not, never got comfortable being real millionaires. So it was a flash in the pan for us, you know, having uh, $25 million. It wasn't really real money. Uh, it became real money when, you know, took investment out, put it in Canary, and we lost all of that. So it was a really tough time to go through. We took the company public in 1998, and then there was a year that our stock went from roughly four bucks to 92. So it was a tremendous boom. And uh, Luckily for us, we were not just uh, dot-com or telecom centric. We grew very fast. We had like more than about 16 quarters of consecutive growth through this era. And uh, it was hyper growth. Silicon Valley based dot-com companies soon became the hottest commodities on the planet. Companies like Webvan, Pets.com and Excite at Home emerged. The rules were changing. Markets were changing. The opportunity to become a millionaire overnight was a real possibility. Silicon Valley and the suitors it attracted were intoxicated with greed. Hey, I looked up at a billboard and there's a picture of a young woman and it said, $23 million in stock options or a college degree, which essentially I'm getting out of school because there's so much money. Driving in a territory where Everybody believes that if they were just a few minutes earlier at this next meeting, they would make $23 million. It's unsafe. In the midst of the bubble, or, you know, our fundamental markets, our core segments, were the banking community, which was obviously being, you know, just swept over with day trading and consumers wanting to interact with financial institutions. The telecommunications sector, which at that point was focused on getting a DSL line to everybody's house and getting basic connectivity up, and then the startup community, which again was being fueled by a, just an enormous amount of venture capital pouring into Silicon Valley. I mean, in the tens of billions of dollars was being poured in and frankly being distributed to anybody who could you know, raise their hand and say, yes, I think I have a clever business idea. If you look at the rational place that's paid for performance, that's the multiple 
that, that makes sense. Whenever the market goes up way past that, it goes back down as far as it went up. We've never been as far north. We weren't as far north as we are today in 29. There was a part of me during the dot-com boom that was going, this seems really stupid, but it seems to be working. I mean, these guys are making a lot of money somehow. Uh, maybe I just don't get it, right? And, 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 and of course, a, I actually decided that I did get it. It was just really stupid, right? And the whole dot-com bust really was this sort of Darwinian, you know, winnowing out of the really stupid stuff. There was no path to profitability. There was no business model. The question was, how are you going to make money in this business? And I think many entrepreneurs, many venture capitalists, actually never stopped to really focus on that issue. One of the important things to remember about bubbles is that they typically precede build-outs. And so what happened in the evolution of electricity was there was a euphoria around this thing, this new thing called electricity, but ultimately there was a global build-out that electrified the planet where there's really not so much of a power divide anymore as there may have existed initially, as just today, you know, we're moving toward eliminating the digital divide. The network is becoming a social utility that really connects everybody and everything on the planet.